open scripture this morning. We are continuing in the book of Hebrews. Uh, we've been in this series for a couple of weeks now. Uh, and, and so as we, as we have been in this series, I want to just quick do a recap. The book of Hebrews has a number of sections uh, that emphasize particular things. The first, uh, the first section of Hebrews, Hebrews 1 through 4, verse 13, really emphasize uh, the, the, the fact that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. He is the one who came uh, as, as both God and human to fulfill the law. Um, and so as we, as we prepare to kind of finish out this first section, uh, we just want to recap very quickly where, uh, where we've been. Remember we talked about Hebrews being the book of better things. That the book of Hebrews was written uh, to the uh, Jewish people who were scattered throughout the Roman Empire, mostly specifically to Jewish converts to Christianity who were dealing with uh, persecution and were considering uh, turning back to Judaism, turning back, backsliding, thinking, oh, you know, this, this Jesus thing got me a lot of trouble, so maybe, maybe I just need to go back to, to my old ways, the ways of the law, the, the, the Judaism ways. But the message of the book of Hebrews is, no, don't do that. Jesus is the real deal. Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. Jesus is better. Whatever laws, whatever religion, whatever things that used to be, Jesus is better. He is the fulfillment of those things. And so uh, at the very beginning, uh, the, the author writes about Jesus' divinity and Jesus' humanity. Jesus, uh, he said, uh, in the last days, God has spoken, in, in verse 2, 1 verse 2, God has spoken uh, to us by his Son. And, and verse 3 says, the Son is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things through his powerful word. And you may hear in that some echoes of John 1. Uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. This is all talking about Jesus and the fact that Jesus is God. But Jesus also became human. We call this the incarnation. Jesus putting on human flesh, coming to this world as a human. Uh, and, and, and this has to happen uh, for the salvation to take place, for the atonement to be something. Jesus' sacrifice for our sins took place and was effective because Jesus was also fully human. Verse 2 verse 17 says, right, he had to be made like them, fully human in every way. And that because uh, Jesus himself was human, because he suffered when he was tempted, he is also able to help those who are being tempted. And we'll come back to that in just a minute. Jesus uh, Jesus' humanity is, is so important. He was made lower than the angels, the book of Hebrews says. He was a human in every sense of the word. So everything that you know about the human condition, Jesus was that with the exception of one thing. He did not sin. He was without sin. He kept, or maybe uh, the word fulfilled, the law. All of the law. Everything that we know about the law in the Old Testament, the law that's given in Exodus and Leviticus, he kept all of that and fulfilled it uh, in, its, in its fullest sense. Jesus' whole life was the living embodiment of, of what the proper interpretation of the law is, which is God's self-revelation. The law is God's self-revelation to his people. Um, it's, it's God's revelation of how to live as he wants them to live, how to live holy lives and, and be set apart. Jesus sums up the whole law in the New Testament by saying this, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And this is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it, like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All of the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Jesus' whole life was a revelation of what it meant to live and love as God lives and loves. To live holy and set apart lives. So consequently, the law, and when we say the law, we're talking about uh, way back in the Old Testament. Exodus and Leviticus. The, you, think, the, you think the Ten Commandments and, and the little bit after that, uh, the, the books that are, let's be honest, kind of boring to read. Yeah? Like these are the books where if you're doing the year through the Bible thing, like everybody's like, Leviticus, I'm out. 
right? We'll pick it back up in May when we get to Joshua. That's a little bit more interesting kind of a thing. That's, it's a difficult read, but all of this is a, is a revelation of what God, how God calls his people to live, and all of it can be summed up in one word, love, love. Consequently, so the law, uh, it, it also, because, because the law is given, and really, honestly, the law is given with no intention that the people of God are ever actually going to be able to live up to this. God knows his people are human, so the law also points out where we fall short, where they fell short. It's where we don't live holy and set-apart lives that are filled with God's love. But Jesus comes, and he lives it out. He lives it out in his life. He says, don't think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I have, I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. He says this in the, in the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. It's, it's closer to the beginning of his ministry that, that what his life represents is the fulfillment of the law, living and loving as God lives and loves. The problem with what we know about the law is that there are actually two sets of laws that the Jewish people dealt with. You have the Old, Old Testament, Levitical laws, we, we call them kind of the holiness laws or uh, what we know to be, if we want to say law with a capital L. But there's also another law. It's a human law that was given by the Pharisees when the people of God came back from exile. So if you remember the story with me real quick, the people of God, uh, the, the, they have some kings and they, they sin and they send some prophets and, and the prophets say, hey, you need to follow God's law. Uh, you need to turn your heart towards God because it's the heart change. That's what it's all about. You need to love the way God wants you to love. And the people say, no, nah. no, nah, we're not going to do that. And, and then God says, well, you really need to do that. And if you don't do that, I'm, I'm going to punish you. And, and they say, no, nah, no, nah, it's not going to do that. And so God eventually punishes the people of Israel. They go into exile um, and they're, they're in exile for 70 years. And then when they come back, there's some, some super smart people we call Pharisees. And they're like, well, we don't ever want to do that again. So we're going to create new laws. We're going to create laws that, that guard the law. And so they come up with some 600 and some odd uh, more laws to add to the law, you know, because God's law wasn't good enough, right? And so they added a whole bunch of other things to it, and, and that's what Jesus pushes back against. And he even says that the Pharisees are challenging him on their own little laws because their laws were all legalistic. It was all about don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, because if you don't do those things, then you won't break the actual law, and then you won't sin. But it misses the whole point of the heart change. It misses the whole point of the love thing. And, and, and so Jesus challenges them on this. He says, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding to human traditions. The people struggled. The people were oppressed by this secondary law because not only was the first law was impossible to keep anyways, but it's what God, what God calls us to do and was really a blueprint for the Messiah. The, this secondary law was even worse. It was like bondage to them. They couldn't do anything. But Hebrews 2 ends by saying, you know, because Jesus struggled in this life, because Jesus suffered when he was tempted, he uh, also understands what we face and he came to fulfill what God actually calls his people to do so that a path can be made for us and for our salvation. And that's really what Hebrews chapter 3 is all about. Hebrews chapter 3 uh, says, well, so there was, there was Moses, and, and Moses was a faithful servant of God's house. He's bearing witness to what would be spoken by God in the future. So the law has something to do with Jesus. And then Jesus comes along as the faithful son over God's house. So servant versus son. God's son, the son over God's house. And we are his house. Therefore, Jesus is over us. Jesus is Lord over us. And then an invitation is, is given. As, as uh, the writer here is, is interpreting Psalm 95, he says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. And this is what... Hebrews is, is really addressing. You got Jewish converts to Christianity who are saying, I don't think this Christian thing is so great because I'm getting persecuted. I'm getting threatened to put in jail. People are threatening to kill me. It's really uncomfortable. I think I'm just going to go back to what I had. 
I know that. It's easier. And the writer says, don't, no, 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 no. Don't, don't do that. Don't do what the people of Israel did so often. You're, you remember the story of the, the people of Israel wandering in the wilderness, right? They get out of Egypt. Ten plagues. God magnificently shows who he is and, and all of this. And they get into Egypt. The first thing he said is, oh, we're hungry. Let's go back to Egypt. And, and then God provides food. And then like, oh, we're thirsty. Let's go back to Egypt. And then a little bit later, like, oh, this sand is too hot. Let's go back to Egypt. I don't actually, that's not actually in the Bible, but uh, it's pr- probably happened, right? <laughs> and, and, and just over and over and over again, like these whiny little kids, like, uh, you know, oh, I don't really like this. Let's go home. Let's go home. That's what they, that's really what happened. And they kept turning away from God to the point where they went right up to the edge of the promised land. And, they're, and, and, and they sent spies in. You remember this story? They sent spies into the promised land and, and 12 of them, the, t- the 12 spies went in, the 12 spies came back. Two of them were like, let's go in. And the other 10 were like, no, we can't do that. And then the people were like, oh, why did you bring us here, God? You just brought us here to die. And let's go back to Egypt because that's, what's, what, that's like their only response. Is, let's just go back to what we know. Let's go back to what's comfortable. Let's go back to bondage because at least it's comfortable. At least it's very clear. There are very black and white boundaries. And that's what happens. And and so the author is saying to the Jewish people, who the Jewish converts to Christianity who are saying, Wow, maybe we should go back to Judaism because that's easier and we didn't get we didn't get beat up on so much. He's saying, Don't do that. Jesus is the real deal. The author encourages Jewish Christians with regard to the persecution that they're facing, urged not to do what the Israelites did so often in the wilderness. Like them, we who have encountered Jesus Christ have experienced the power and love of God, being freed from the captivity of sin, uh, being freed from the oppression of the law, if you will, and, and we're brought into this eternal redemption, this eternal salvation, and what the author says is eternal rest. And that's what we're going to turn to today, is this rest, this idea of, of Sabbath rest that that Jesus offers. So I want to invite you to turn with me to scripture to to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. If you don't have a Bible in front of you, you're welcome to use one of ours. It's located underneath the seats in front of you. uh, Or the words will be on the screen. And you can follow along there as well. Hebrews chapter 4. Listen for the word of the Lord. Therefore, and just for the record, therefore means that the author is drawing on things that, that, that he or she just said. So verse, or chapter 2 begins with a therefore because it's drawing on uh, chapter 1. Verse, or ch- ver- chapter 3 begins with a therefore drawing on things from chapter 2 and 1. And verse, or chapter 4 begins with therefore drawing on what he or she just said in ver- chapters 1, 2, and 3. So we're, we're, we're making a big, long argument here about Jesus being the Messiah and the fulfillment of the law. Therefore, the author says, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. For we also have the good news proclaimed to us just as they did. But the message they heard was of no value to them because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. Now we who have believed enter that rest. Just as God has said, so I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. And yet his works have been finished since the creation of the world. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words. On the seventh day God rested from all his works And again, in the passage above, he says, they shall never enter my rest. Therefore, since it still remains for some to enter that rest, and since those who formerly had the good news proclaimed to them did not go in because of their disobedience, God again set a certain day, calling it today. This is... This he did when a long time later he spoke through David as in the passage already quoted. This is Psalm 95. He's he's quoting, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. And for anyone who enters, God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest, 
so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, and joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I remember a time, not too long ago actually, uh, by some standards I suppose, it was most of my life, which is, you know, that, that feels like a long time for me, but uh, maybe not for, for uh, others, right? Uh, not too long ago when on Sunday we were only allowed to play in the backyard. Maybe you remember this. Maybe you had a similar experience. You had to play in the backyard because then the other neighbors couldn't see that you were outside because it was Sunday. Yeah? Yeah? Some of you maybe made your kids do this. Some of you that are kind of my age are feeling that a little bit maybe. You, you, you weren't a lot, you know, because we didn't want to see anybody having fun. If you, if you read your bulletin, you, you saw this. My brother and I would play in the backyard and we would hope against hope that some of the neighbor kids would come over uh, because if they came over, they could play in the backyard with us so that nobody could see that we were playing in the backyard with other people who were also obviously horrible people, um, right? And, and, and it was okay. Down the street, we had neighbors, we had people that, that were down the street that said, you can't do anything. Like their house was closed up, the garage was down, the lines were drawn, nothing on Sunday. You can't do anything. And then across the street from them was the exact opposite, the neighbors who forced their kids to play in the front yard like all day Sunday, even on a day like today, just to stick it to everyone else. Right? <laughs> we all wanted to be like those kids, secretly. Right? And, and if you were to ask my parents at that time, why are you doing this? They'd say, well, because it's Sunday. Because it's the Lord's Day. That's what you do. I remember the first time not so long ago that I walked into church uh, wearing shorts for the first time. That's not today, just for the record. Uh, uh, I was like 15 or, or something like that. It was a youth Sunday. And my parents were like, go ahead, wear shorts. And I'm like, what? Are you kidding me? Like, okay. Are you sure? Can I at least wear my Sunday shoes? That, that's at least, you know, the, I'm used to wearing those. And no, that'll look dumb. You can't wear Sunday shoes with shorts. Okay, whatever. And you kind of like hesitantly walk into church. You're like, okay, haven't been struck by lightning yet. I think we're good. <sighs> right? And why? Because it's Sunday. And you don't wear shorts to church on Sunday. That's, you know, that's what my parents would have said. Uh, and, because it's, it's the Lord's Day and, and because you got to, uh, there's a lot, I mean, there's a lot of reasons, a lot of, a lot of reasons why. I remember a, a day not so long ago where we went out to lunch after church. We never did this because it's Sunday. Don't go out to eat on Sunday, but we went out to, to Logan's. At this point in time, I was actually working as a server, uh, a busboy and then a server at Mountain Jack Steakhouse. Anybody remember Mountain Jack Steakhouse? Yeah? Great prime rib. Uh, I was working there, so I knew, you know, busy days, busy days were awful, but so good because you made a lot of money. And, and so we went to Logan's and it was slammed busy. Like, so I was like, it's Sunday. What, we're, who are all these people? Like, nobody even comes outside on Sundays. And, and all these people were here, so I just made a comment to our waitress. I said, oh, it must be a good day for you. And she goes, it's Sunday. I was like, what, well, what does that mean? She's like, all these people come from church and they don't tip me because I work on Sundays. A what? <laughs> I, I was blown away. Maybe you've had similar experiences. Right? Sunday is a different day. Uh, there's, there's something about it. It's a day of rest. We, we call it the Sabbath day, even though the Sabbath day is actually Saturday. Uh, w but we have this sort of different feeling about Sunday. Because the Bible talks about Sabbath and the Bible talks about rest. And our scripture passage today talks about Sabbath rest. So let's talk about that for, that, about that for a minute. There's kind of a long, drawn-out thing 
in the Bible that has to do with Sabbath rest. And it begins all the way back in Genesis chapter 2. Genesis 2 says, right on the seventh day, God finished what he had been doing, creation, right, just a little thing. Uh, he created the whole world, and then uh, on the seventh day, he rested. And God blessed the seventh day, and he made it holy because he rested from all his work, from all the creating that he had done. This is the beginning of, of what Sabbath is, or the kind of beginning idea that, that the seventh day, it's different somehow. It, 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 there's, there's something about it. You know, later on in the book of Exodus, we get the, the Ten Commandments, the revelation of God's uh, law and God's self-revelation of, of what it means to live set apart. And, and, and so you may remember this commandment, right? Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. And apparently that meant playing in the backyard, not in the front yard, just for looks, and not wearing shorts to church and not tipping your waitresses. That's what it means to... No. But we had this sort of difference of idea that, that somehow the seventh day, or we, well, the Christian celebrated as being Sunday, uh, because Jesus rose on a Sunday, not on a Saturday. And, uh, and, and so we, we set it apart and, and keep it holy, just for looks, apparently. And, and it, but something's different about this day. And, and so later on, then, uh, in, in Exodus, we also get this idea of a Sabbath year, uh, that six years in a row you can work, but on the seventh year you're supposed to leave your fields empty. I challenge any of you farmers to do that, right? <laughs> even if it rains every single day and you just can't plant your field, right? It's, it, it, nobody, they didn't even do this. The people of Israel didn't even do this. But there, there's something about this seventh something, seventh day, seventh year, uh, where it's, um, it's different. It's different. And so this sort of legalistic idea crops up of how we're supposed to treat the Sabbath. And uh, this shows up in, later in the, in the Old Testament uh, in this Pharisaical law, this post-exile Pharisee law thing. You can only walk like a certain number of steps, like 150 steps on a Sunday, or on a Sabbath day. That's okay, but 151, that's work. And you can't work on the Sabbath, so sorry. Right? Uh, you can't, uh, you, you can uh, boil your vegetables on the Sabbath, but you can't grill because if you grill, that's work and uh, that's breaking the sap. <laughs> Just kidding. They didn't have grills. But it's that, that idea that we, we make these weird legalistic distinctions about Sabbath, about rest, because the Bible says you have to honor the Sabbath day and you have to keep it holy. We miss a part of Scripture where God, as he's revealing the law, as he's revealing how he wants his people to live as set-apart people, we miss the part about the heart change where God is working on our heart to make us more like him, to make us holy, to make us set-apart, because we can't do this ourselves. So God says to Moses, say to the Israelites, you must observe my Sabbaths. It will be a sign between me and you for the generations to come so that you may know that I am the Lord who makes you holy. It's not about what you do. It's a sign of a covenant relationship between me and you. And that as we participate in this relationship, I make you holy. And part of that is woven into rest. Rest. We'll come back to that in just a minute. Continue. Later on, uh, another analogy is made to the Sabbath of the Sabbath as being sort of equivalent to entering the promised land. Remember the people of Israel leave Egypt and they, they wander through the wilderness and eventually they're going to go into this promised land, the place that God promises uh, to them and their, their ancestors and their generations to come and all this. And, and that's, that's equated to being sort of Sabbath rest. Uh, that you will cross the Jordan, uh, God says, uh, or, or, in, in Deuteronomy, uh, you, you will take your inheritance and he will give you rest from all of your enemies around you so that you will live in safety. Um, that, uh, and then Joshua says too, remember the command that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you, that the Lord will give you rest by giving you this land, that entering into the promised land, into this new life that they were going to have, was somehow rest. Now, there's an interesting correlation here. Uh, the name Joshua and the name Jesus you want to pronounce them appropriately, both are pronounced Yeshua, and both mean the exact same thing. God saves, God rescues, God's gift. 
both lead us into Sabbath rest. Because all of the Old Testament points to Jesus. All of the Old Testament is about Jesus. It's all a precursor to what God is doing and pointing to the coming of the Messiah. The Sabbath is not about what we do or don't do. It's about a covenant relationship with God and about a heart change, about trust, where we trust that God is at work in us to make us holy and set apart. Something that was being done in the Old Testament, something that is done and continuing to be done in Jesus Christ. So this idea of Sabbath rest continues, and we see this already in the book of Hebrews, but uh, uh, Isaiah talks about rest, uh, David talks about rest in, in Psalm 95, and all these things happen after the Israelites enter the promised land. So this idea of rest is continuing to be drawn forward, that the promised land was not the final rest, but that it was an image of what is to come. And so the writer of Hebrews says this, Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, or later on, therefore, since it still remains for some to enter that rest, that we recognize that it's not all about not doing anything on Sundays, but that when we're talking about Sabbath in its greatest sense, it has more to do with God's work in us than it has to do with our, our work or lack thereof on a particular day. So there are three senses in which we, t or actually four senses in which we talk about the Sabbath. No work on Sundays. Yeah? You can get on board with that. That's something that you probably have heard once or twice before. Um, you know, if you, if you have a particular job that requires you to work on Sundays, tough luck. You're just kind of out of God's will apparently. Just kidding. Ooh, it's kind of heavy in here, right? Just, just kidding, right? But this is the idea. No work on Sundays or you have to set a day apart, something like that. The idea of Sabbath rest as salvation. That, that in Jesus Christ, we find a Sabbath rest when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. We also talk about a Sabbath or a rest in, in death. Uh, that when we die, we, we sleep, we are with God, that we rest from life's work. We're no longer sinning anymore. And that we, we enter into what, what we sometimes use the phrase, that blessed rest that is in Jesus Christ. And then finally, this idea of a return to Eden or the return to the way the world was meant to be when Jesus Christ comes again. That all things will be made right. And, and this, is, this is the idea that is put forth in Genesis chapter 2 when there isn't actually an evening and a morning on the seventh day. Go back there a second. The seventh day God rested from all of his works. And God blessed the seventh day and he made it holy because on it he rested from all of his work creating that he had done. And then it goes into the next one, the next section. And this is the count of the heavens and the earth. Da, 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 da. There is no evening and morning on the seventh day. And so the idea that when Jesus Christ comes again, when everything is being made right and everything is perfect, that we have this sort of return to paradise where we dwell with God and we enter into that eternal rest that is eternity in the presence of God. And so as Christians, this is kind of how we think about this. These ones are really, really easy. If I don't work on Sundays, I'm observing the Sabbath. Ergo, I'm a good Christian. When I die, I won't sin anymore and I will go to heaven and I will be with God and I will receive that rest and then Jesus will come back and uh, that will be, you know, even better and I'm excited for that. That's what Sabbath looks like to us. A rest that is fairly black and white, fairly well described, and fairly easy to follow. It doesn't take a lot of heart to believe that. But what the writer of Hebrews is talking about is not a daily observance and is not some future thing that hasn't yet happened. The writer of Hebrews actually looks at it more like this. That our rest is now. That the Sabbath has come 
in Jesus Christ. That we can enter into it in our lives now and rest. Our tendency is to focus on the others because they're easy. Because they make sense, because they're descript. But the idea of Sabbath as salvation, or salvation as Sabbath, is so powerful because it emphasizes Jesus' fulfillment of the law, fulfillment of all that God calls us to be, and our participation in that through faith. That we who are in Christ enter into a Sabbath rest where we no longer have to fear working and doing all the things that we have to do, all the do's and do nots. Now, don't get me wrong. There's, there's, there, is, there are boundaries in the New Testament. There are lots of boundaries in the New Testament about the things that, that we should not do. Things that are out of bounds for us who are living in Christ. And, and we'll get to that in a second. But what happens first is that when we believe in Jesus Christ, who came to fulfill, he did the work for us to fulfill the law. And then he sat down, Scripture says, at the right hand of God. And then Scripture also says, and we who are in Christ are seated with him. We are welcomed into the presence of God. We are allowed to be in relationship with God again. Right? The, the, the temple curtain was torn because Jesus Christ made a way back to God. And we don't have to make that way anymore. We don't have to do it ourselves because he's done it for us. And in that moment, when we believe in Christ, something happens. We no longer have to earn it. We no longer have to prove it. We no longer have to strive to get it because it's already been done. And our heart can change. Now, there are still boundaries. There are still things. Paul talks, I mean... Every letter to every church in the New Testament is filled with some things that you probably shouldn't do, right? You probably shouldn't celebrate incest. Duh, right? That, it's in 1 Corinthians if you want to look it up. Uh, right? You probably should be considerate of those who are maybe not as spiritually mature as you, those who are new Christians. You probably should do that. This is a boundary. But it's not a law. It comes out of the heart change that takes place when we put our faith in Jesus Christ and we turn our hearts towards him. We don't throw away the law because Jesus didn't throw away the law. He fulfilled the law. And we live out of what God has called us to in Scripture. Not to earn our way, not to make our own salvation. Right? No rest has ever come from doing, no, no eternal rest like this has ever come from the work that we do. But it's the work that Jesus has done. And so, when our heart changes, we receive that. We are welcomed into that. And Hebrews 4 is very clear. That promise is still open. The image of God is still being built in us. And no matter where we turn, whether we have turned to Christ or not, and if we are there, if we've turned away, because it happens, let's be honest, we all sin. We've all sinned today. You know, it happens. That promise is still there. And, 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 I mean, sin in this respect is like trying to do more work. We're trying to do more things. We're turning away. We're turning back to ourselves. We're trying to take things on for ourselves. And the reality is, is that you don't have to do that. God says you don't need to do that anymore because I've done it all in Jesus Christ. Take the rest. Allow your heart to rest, to trust in God. It doesn't make any sense. If you think about this for a second. In this world today especially, uh, a 24-7, 365 world where business goes on, whether we like it or not, it doesn't make any sense to take a day off. 
doesn't. But God invites us into rest, physical rest, as a symbol of trust, of recognition that it isn't our work that gets us where we ultimately need to go, but it's his. And so a physical act as a sign that it's not us, but God who makes us holy. Augustine, great, uh, great writer, theologian uh, from way, 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 way back, like a uh, long time ago, says this, which I think is just so fitting. Our hearts are restless until we find our rest in you. He's talking to God. Our hearts are restless until we find our rest in you. The author of Hebrews closes out this section with something that doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. It it kind of is weird. It doesn't really fit. All of a sudden, he's talking about the Word of God. We were just talking about rest and all this. But it it actually fits perfectly because, because this is a heart thing that's going on here. Our hearts are being challenged. Our hearts are being rended towards God. And Sabbath is a part of that. Like so many other things in Scripture, they're, they're a part of challenging us to turn our hearts towards God. And so he makes the point, and, and, and you can hear echoes throughout the entire first four chapters, that the Word of God is alive and active. Who's the Word of God? Jesus. The Word of God is alive and active. Who is the final spoken Word of God? Right? In the former days, God spoke through the prophets in various times and various places. But in the last days, God has spoken to us through His Son. Right? The Word of God, the, the spoken Word, the literal Word of God is alive and active. Sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow, judges, it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Because it's all about the heart. It's not about legalistic practices. It's not about striving. It's not about doing our own things. It's about the fact that Jesus did it. And we can trust in him. And we can rest in him. It judges the attitudes and thoughts of the heart. You could even, you could change that word just a little bit to say too. It challenges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all of creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and lay bare before him. Before the eyes of him who, to whom we must give an account. This is so important. As we steep ourselves in the word, as we continue to look into God's word, and we continue to look to God's word, Jesus Christ, we begin to see that change taking place in us. It's not about what we do. It's about what he's already done for us. And so the invitation today, the invitation today is to challenge whatever it is that's going on in your heart. These same themes get picked up in in the New Testament Uh, when Jesus invites his disciples to the table. He talks a lot about wedding feasts and banquets and things like that. The invitations go out not to uh, people with merit because they they, they don't respond. It's to the people that don't have it. The people that that are are considered to be poor, outcasts, or whatever it is. They are invited not because of anything that they've done, but because... The bridegroom wants to celebrate. And he wants people to be there. And so the promise to enter that rest is still open. It's open to those who do not know Jesus. And if you don't know Jesus today, I'd love to have that conversation. It's also open to those who do know Jesus and who are working so hard in their lives and so uh, desire to earn their own way even though they've already met the only way, truth, and life. So we're going to pause for a moment. And before we come to the table, I'm going to invite the band to come forward. We're going to sing a song together. Um, Blessed Assurance. 
Um, you may have heard this song before. Beautiful song. One of my favorites. Um, we're going to sing it. And I want to invite you to think. Think about what's going on in your heart today. Think about what it is that you're working on or working towards or striving for. Things that, that God invites you to lay down, to rest, and to put your trust in Him. We're going to sing it, then we'll come to the table.